Greg. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. There you go. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It seems like from the past few talks, I mean, a lot of talk about quantum computing and physicists up on the stage, which is awesome. So as we think about quantum computing, I want to set the stage a little bit for you. Now it might seem a little bit far-fetched, but one could make the argument that the fundamental building blocks of computing haven't really changed that much over the last 4,000 years. Whether it's moving beads on an abacus from left to right, or flipping a, a, a transistor on and off, ones and zeros, left, right, ones and zeros, kind of different names for the same underlying building block. And of course, the technology has changed dramatically in terms of the scaling of the number of transistors and how we can automate things. But those underlying building blocks, this one-to-one -one representation of data, has remained the same. Now fast forward to today. We're on the precipice of having quantum computers. Or with a quantum computer, we can try out on a single piece of hardware all possible computational paths at once. And where the building blocks of compute are totally different. They're based on the fundamental physics, fundamental quantum physics. And it turns out that for a few classes of problems, these building blocks of quantum physics are much better suited to solving some of these problems that are today unsolvable. You just think about the types of numbers that we saw from the last presenter. We're looking at search spaces of larger than the universe. And these building blocks of quantum mechanics can unlock some of these problems. So over the next sort of 15 minutes or so, I'm going to look for my clock. I think it's over here. Um, the, the kind of big things that I'm going to talk to you about are, are really why quantum is different. Talk some more about these key application areas where quantum has the better building blocks that are suited to solve them. And then talk about the disruptive potential of quantum computing. OK, so why quantum computing? Well, despite kind of all of the advancements that we have made with these conventional building blocks for computing, the past 50, 60 years, let's say, of Moore's law and the doubling of transistor counts, and the seemingly limitless compute power that we have in the cloud today, some problems remain completely intractable. And so this is an example of one of these intractable problems. Um, many in the room might recognize this. This is an RSA 2048 key. And of course, RSA cryptography is, kind of underpins a, a lot of our modern economy. Something like 80 to 90% of all web traffic is encrypted with RSA. And this is a problem that's really easy for these conventional computers to solve in the forward direction. We can multiply numbers this size very fast. By figuring out which two large primes were multiplied together to give this to give this large prime is a very large, is a, is a very hard problem. Um, any guesses in the audience of the two large primes that were multiplied together? <laughs> That's pretty hard. Uh, in fact, it's so hard that using our conventional compute, uh, this problem, this key that I just showed you, it would take us on average about a billion years uh, to find those numbers. So you're in good company if you didn't have them. But for this problem, with a quantum computer of the right size, and high enough quality of the qubits, this is a problem that can be solved in about 100 seconds. And so now I have to put a little disclaimer here. I'm, I'm from Microsoft, and um, I can let you know that Microsoft is not going to be in the business of cracking everyone's RSA. Uh, and we're actively uh, working on a solution to make our cryptography secure. OK, here's another one. This is a picture of the fastest supercomputer in the world. It's located in China. It's 93 petaflops. This computer can do a good job of simulating the chemical properties of this molecule, caffeine. And so it's, it's a pretty important molecule. It, it powers many of us and many of our organizations. But once the molecule gets just a little bit bigger, just a little bit more complicated, like this one, now it would take this computer longer than the lifetime of the universe 
to simulate the chemical properties of this molecule. But it's still a pretty simple molecule. I can, I can write it down. But now it's, it's a little bit small to see. Um, but if, you'll, if you notice carefully, uh, there are some differences with this molecule, molecule. And namely, there are metals involved. And so now these complex molecules quickly become out of reach of computers like these, based on these conventional building blocks. So why is that? Well, it turns out that nature computes using the language of quantum physics. So being able to understand uh, really simple questions, seemingly simple questions, like why is this leaf green? We need to understand quantum physics. And there was a group of physicists, a handful of physicists in about in the 80s, uh, Feynman among them, who had this frustration of being able to simulate what was going on with these, these chemical compounds, small, small molecules. And it's because the, the behavior of these molecules is dictated by quantum physics. And so, you know, Feynman and others had the idea of, rather than being frustrated, they knew, they knew the compute power would be limited just by doing the math of, of how many combinations of electron orbitals and interactions that we would be limited by the compute capability using these, these traditional building blocks. And so they had the idea to, to really flip the problem on its head. And instead of building conventional computer that would simulate these quantum mechanical computers, they had the idea to, what if we use nature that was doing these calculations inherently, use that as the computer? And that was the birth of the idea of, of quantum computing. So these are some of the problems that we're really excited about using the quantum computer to solve. Uh, you know, I won't be the one to say that quantum computers will never do our email and our web browsing, um, but not for the for foreseeable future. And uh, you know, quantum computers, in terms of the algorithms that we know of, and, and it's a fairly limited batch, is, is a relatively niche application. It will be, it'll be a coprocessor to our classical workloads. But it turns out these niche applications, and I'll walk through a few of them now, it turns out these niche applications will have profound implications for our economic and societal landscape. So I'll walk through a few of these. So the first that I want to talk about is, is nitrogen fixation. And this is really a problem of world hunger. And so the way that we create artificial fertilizer, the problem is that we that we take nitrogen from the atmosphere and we convert it into ammonia to make artificial fertilizer. And that's really hard because nitrogen in the atmosphere is held together with a triple covalent bond and that bond is hard to break. And so the way that we do this at the industrial level is we use a process that's over 100 years old now. It was invented in Germany in the early 1900s called the Haber-Bosch process. And this process happens at high temperature, high pressure, and consumes about 3% of the world's natural gas. But we know that nature can do this much more efficiently, can break this bond. And if you have any gardeners in your life, or you go back to you know, before we had artificial fertilizers, farmers rotated crops through. And they rotated the beans through specifically. And beans have the, the, have the property of fixing nitrogen into the soil. And the way that they do that is there is a bacteria that lives in the roots of the bean plant, and that bacteria creates an enzyme called nitrogenase. And nitrogenase can slice through that triple bond that holds the two nitrogens together in the atmosphere. But we don't have the ability computationally to understand that molecule nitrogenase. And the reason is because at the heart of that molecule is that iron molybdenum complex that I showed you a couple slides ago. It would take us longer than the lifetime of the universe. And so over the past sort of 100 years, we haven't been able to improve upon that process. So that's a catalysis problem that we could use the quantum computer to study. The next one's also a catalysis problem. The idea is that we could use the quantum computer to design a catalyst that could take carbon out of the atmosphere and start to mitigate, if not reverse, global warming. The next problem is in the material space, also a simulation of a physical system. It's long been the dream of material scientists and physicists to create a, a, a material that would superconduct at room temperature. 
Now imagine you create an, a material where the electrons go zipping along at the, near the speed of light without any losses. Imagine what would be possible. I mean, just at the very surface of it, we lose about 15% of all electricity generated just through losses in the materials in our electrical grids. Just the impact of that would be enough to do this. But think about what else is possible. If, you know, new, new smart materials, better battery technology. The possibilities are endless. So those first three were all about simulating the properties of physical systems that are inherently quantum in nature and using a quantum system to do that. The next, which you heard about in the last presentation, is about machine learning. We know that for large quantum models, they can train with quantum data exponentially faster than, than classical systems can. And in the quantum world, we refer a lot to conventional computers as, as classical systems, so you may hear that from me. And the excitement around machine learning is that you could, you could use a quantum model that would train faster to higher accuracy with far less data. So this is an area of active research. The next application area is in solving hard optimization problems. So these hard optimization problems where you have lots of different routes, but also lots of constraints that, can, that need to be satisfied. Think traffic optimization, route planning, job scheduling. These problems explode computationally, and, and they're also a good fit for the quantum computer. And the reason these problems are so hard to solve computationally is you know, one method that we have for solving them is mapping them into an energy landscape. And so here on the slide, I have a very simple uh, looking energy landscape. And what makes these problems so hard to solve is that you can get stuck in a local minima or a local optima of the solution. And it's very hard to know that you're in a local optima. These are kind of rough energy landscapes. And it's hard to know that you're there and it's very, very hard to find uh, the global minima, or even a good enough global minima. And so what people tend to do is, is use intuition or years of experience with their experts uh, on solving these problems because they can't be solved computationally. But, but we know uh, what we've discovered in studying these problems is that quantum particles, as they search this parameter space, they can tunnel out of these local minima and find a global optima or a good enough, a good enough solution that's much, much better much faster than we can with conventional methods. And what's exciting about this area is just by learning how we would map these problems to a quantum computer, how we'd use the quantum computer to solve them, we've discovered that we can map these problems back into conventional architectures. And even though they run slower than they will on the quantum computer, they can dramatically outperform previous best in class. And we've seen, you know, in some cases, as much as 4,000 times faster. And so we call these, these solutions quantum-inspired optimization. And then we can further accelerate on specialty classical hardware, things like GPUs and FPGAs, and then accelerate again when quantum hardware becomes available at scale. OK, so I talked about some of these application areas. Let's put some numbers against these. And so going back to my RSA encryption problem, on this chart I have on the vertical axis time to factor an n-bit number. And along the horizontal axis, the number of bits n that I'm factoring. And this is a log log plot. And I'll plot my, uh, it's kind of hard to see, on this, there's a red line down the middle. That's my 2048 challenge key. And so using the compute power that we had in 2003, uh, this was a com it's solving this 2048 challenge problem. Uh, this was a problem that, that took longer than the lifetime of the universe to solve. Fast forward to 2018. I've moved the curve with the, kind of the tremendous compute uh, power increases that we've made over the past 15 years. All I've done is scoot this curve a little bit over to the right. And so now, the, now instead of longer than the lifetime of the universe, I've got it down to a mere billion years. Uh, but quantum computing, what makes this so exciting is it doesn't just shift this curve over to the right. I'm not making incremental improvements. I'm not running my classical workloads faster. I'm really solving these problems in a totally different way and I get a totally different curve. I don't get an incremental shift. So if I clock my quantum computer at a megahertz, now I'm down to a solution in about a day, a few days, give or take. If I can clock this quantum computer at a gigahertz, I'm now down to about a minute and a half. 
And so really this represents kind of a, from a numerical perspective, how quantum computing is a totally different compute paradigm and allows us you know, to, to dramatic shifts in the compute, in compute capability. And so, you know, a lot of people should be alarmed by this, this slide. Actually, it represents a really big problem that we're actively working to solve also. We need cryptography protocols that will be immune to quantum attacks, and that's something that we're actively working on. Quantum safe crypto protocols running on classical hardware, and it's important that you not need the quantum computer before you can have uh, crypto protocols that are safe from quantum attacks. Okay, so what's required to, to solve these real problems? You know, what's required to, to, to get to these application areas that I walked through before? Well, we need to build a pretty extraordinary piece of hardware. And this is the inside of one of these systems. We put them inside what's called a dilution refrigerator. Um, th this is the inside of one of those systems. It's sort of about this big. Um, and at the heart of this system is the quantum hardware itself. And in order to be able to solve these real world problems, I need a system that scales not just to tens and hundreds of qubits, but thousands, millions, maybe even billions of qubits. And so we really need to think about all of the elements of scale to make this a reality. So at the heart of this is the quantum hardware. But in order to get to be able to solve real world problems, you need quantum hardware that scales. So we're building a, a scalable qubit foundation. So building hardware that harnesses this power of quantum physics, um, one of the kind of pitfalls with this is that the quantum bits or the qubits are really, are really sensitive to noise. And noise could be anything. It could be temperature, just the things bouncing around uh, can measure the quantum system. It could be a cosmic ray coming in from space. And so we need to protect them from the environment. So we do that with, a, with this cryogenic system. But then you also need a qubit that's inherently resilient to noise. And so that's one of the things you know, we're working on. But having something that that's, that's kind of doesn't get perturbed by, by noises from the environment. So you need a scalable qubit foundation. You need cryogenic systems that can scale as you build up these machines. You need new inventions at this quantum classical interface. One of the, one of the hardest problems about building a quantum computer is controlling the quantum bits. It turns out you need a really powerful classical computer to control the, the quantum hardware itself. We need to develop new platforms for identifying and correcting the errors that happen. So this special kind of quantum error correction to correct for these errors. You need a scalable software stack to be able to, to program the quantum hardware. The, well, you need to program the classical hardware that's running the quantum hardware and the quantum hardware itself. Uh, you need to integrate this into, into scale cloud systems. You know, for this to be relevant for enterprise grade customers or people wanting to solve these problems, it needs to be cloud integrated. And we need to write the algorithms in the real world applications. And of course, all of these elements of the stack, all of these elements of scale are deeply interrelated. And it's important to work across all of these if you want to realize kind of the power of these machines. And so uh, just to close out, I you know, wanted to present one slide just to kind of give you some ideas and, and a little bit of inspiration and, and share some of my personal excitement for this space. And so as we look kind of over the history of the past, I don't know, hundreds of years, we see time and again that new physics leads to new technologies. And you look at the Industrial Revolution, you know, what power made the steam engine possible is the laws of thermodynamics. And that's not to say that the laws of thermodynamics kind of predate the Industrial Revolution, but it's the basis of which we have for creating things like steam engines. Arguably, all of our modern economy today, with all of our compute and communications infrastructure, is built on the laws of Maxwell's equations. And when I was studying physics, I always wondered what it would be like to live during one of these times when things were changing so fast, when quantum mechanics was being discovered, or you know, Maxwell's equations, and how quickly things were changing. I thought, wow, it must have been such an exciting time to be alive. And now, we're at this point where we have this physics that's yet to be fully exploited. These laws of superposition, quantum measurement, quantum entanglement, and we're really, we're, now we're at one of these special times in history where things are going to change dramatically and we'll be able to solve problems that could never be solved before. 
And we're at this time where you know, the, the kind of key pieces have come together for us to be able to build all of those elements of scale to realize a quantum computer and solve some of these unsolvable problems. So this is, you know, for me, it's just a super exciting time to be alive and time to be in tech. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Julie.